systems change, not climate change. We've seen that a lot on placards, marching, marching down the streets in recent protests, and for good reason. The systems we have at the moment, they confuse the mechanism of our economy with the goal of our economy. For most of us, the meaning of life is not accumulating lots of money. And I imagine for most of us, we would define a good life as one with lots of connection to people and places we love, a sense of meaning and purpose. And of course, underpinned with opportunity, especially equal opportunity to make sure that we have basic security and not just in the immediate moment, but for the foreseeable future. Now, there's so much about life that humans can't control, but what we can do is design systems so that everyone has equal opportunity to live without fear of want for work, fear of home, fear for access to food or access to healthcare. And those are all the ingredients that I would include in a recipe for living a dignified life. Now, the economy is a system designed by people and it's meant to work for people and the planet that we all depend on not the other way around. So how do we go about dealing with its design flaws? So firstly, um, designing systems using systems thinking. The Oxford English Dictionary defi defines a system as a set of things working together as a part of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. So a complex whole. And in short, everything is connected and Green Party policies try to reflect this um, as well as environmental and social justice because they are indivisible. And the economy is a system that serves all. And the, pe the more people understand that everything is connected, the more progress we will make in systems change. But unfortunately, that doesn't fit into sound bites. And that's why we're having these conversations today to explore particularly how home is a green issue and then moving into community and projects that, that work around that. But in this conversation, we hope to go further than talking. If all actions are political with a small P or a capital P, then how can we find connections in the work that we're doing in different areas of society so that we can support each other and make more impact in promoting the system change that we urgently need to make our economy more equitable and regenerative. So the guests we have here today are two humans who are working to create equitable regenerative change. And I want to start by letting them introduce themselves. Um, Agamemnon, I'll let you go first. Um, my name is um, Agamemnon Otero. And I guess a lot of people always ask me where I get my name from. And um, uh, you'll hear that I have a, a, an American accent, but I was I was born in Uruguay and I I grew up in New York and for the last 20 years I've been here and here is floating on a 240 ton North Sea fishing ship in Vauxhall, which I've spent the last seven years um, fixing up and uh, I was named after Lord Nelson's HMS Agamemnon because apparently my parents conceived me in barns where that was built. So um, uh, I've 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 been in the UK focused on community owned renewable energy for um, for about 12 years um, and that I would say is because I have been to the mountaintop uh, and come back again there I grew up on self-sustaining communes in America in upstate New York where we grew all our own vegetables, had solar panels on the rooftops, pumped the water, uh, uh, printing press weaveries, uh, dyed the, the yarn and, and all sorts of things that in a, a very, um, I guess you could say it's utopian idealism um, from communes to kibbutzes uh, that I w my parents were looking for. But I come to you today to say that the, the, um, the, the reality is here and now and I have chosen to live in the urban environment in my own space um, and share that with other people, but have um, a way of thinking about resilience, which I can share uh, with you. And it's not a, a finished fixed product. It's more of a um, developing uh, iterative process. Um, when the first team came together in Brixton to create a, Community Energy Project on social housing in 2011. We worked with the Brixton Transition Town community and, um, and, and it was just really how do we address fuel poverty? And over the last uh, 
nine years. It developed from bricks and energy to repowering, which focused on bringing community owned renewable energy to people in fuel poverty and social housing across London to then actually widening that and looking at resilience and sustainability in Energy Garden, which looks at the networks. So you're looking, we work with UK Power Networks, the, the transport infrastructure to TfL, Network Rail, Arriva, you know, the buses, the trains, and the health service, National Health Service. And we bring all those together into growing gardens uh, on uh, health spaces, schools, and um, transport infrastructure, and then fund that by putting in renewable energy because the biggest emitter of trans of carbon emissions in the UK is transport. Uh, and the biggest single emitter is network rail and the biggest single emitter in London is transport for London. And so by directly looking at the networks, we can come together under this final piece, uh, which I've, we're calling Energy Garden. Um, and it basically brings people together under a cooperative and it allows them to be one vote, one shareholding uh, members and deliver sustainability, you know, grow vegetables and look at renewable energy and have beehives and hops, but it, and uh, make our own beer and jam or whatever, but actually in that way contribute to the greater community, the 2.4 billion passenger journeys a year that happen on the overground and underground. Um, and so that, that journey itself has been exciting and we're learning every day. And it's all been through the transition of different cooperatives that have come together. And a lot of the principles of the Green Party are embedded in there. Um, and I always like to say it's, it's um, I'm agnostic, party agnostic, because the people that we've been working with have been, um, you know, in fuel poverty and food poverty. We're right on the cusp of that. So we daily, day in and out, we do youth training programs, schools programs and adult mentoring directly looking at how to give people advice on energy, how to support them with eating and health, uh, healthy living and resilience. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to go into you guys, with you guys today. And I know I had seven minutes, so I just want to check in with you, Holly, if that's about seven. You're totally fine. And both of you feel <laughs> free to, to ramble a bit. There's space for that always. Um, thank you, Agamemnon. And Seb, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, um, so I'm coming to you from the other end of the Thames. I'm at my workshop in Woolwich. Um, actually, I'm going to just share a few images, if that's all right, um, uh, just to sort of speed up the, the illustration of what I do. I'm a furniture designer and maker. Um, and uh, I'm going to start by talking about why I do what I do, because I think that's kind of, you know, um, evidently important. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm a designer. A craftsman and environmentalist. Um, so relative to its pre-human state, uh, Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. Um, as a business, we exist to try and change this, championing woodlands and wildlands, uh, rich in biodiversity, which soak up CO2. I believe strongly that what we harvest, make and buy can be part of the solution to this problem. If we ask what resources does nature want to give us and then learn to design and make objects from what it wants to give us. So our woodland in Kent, which is in the image here, uh, is a great example of how we employ this thinking. We coppice it each winter, which gives us material and boosts biodiversity in its regrowth. So um, this small ancient woodland, which we took on uh, about five years ago, is now home to red list species um, because of our interventions and because of our harvesting. Um, and uh, it, it fulfills the needs of the woodland first and then uh, our designs second. So the green areas in this picture um, are where we've cut trees and where ground flora is opportunistically growing in these gaps um, before the canopy closes um, when the trees come into leaf. So this was taken earlier this year in the spring. And that creates a solid base of a very diverse food chain, but also gives us resource to harvest. And I kind of exist to dispel the myth that uh, the sound of a chainsaw in a wood is a bad thing. Um, in this part of the world, generally, um, you go up and shake the hand of the person that's cutting the trees down because, um, you know, we, we, we need to manage our woodlands better in order to boost biodiversity. Um, so, yeah, any food chain starts with light and by removing trees, which will self replenish and self regrow. Uh, it's a completely regenerative crop and uh, in, in doing so, removing the trees lets light onto the woodland floor and that rebuilds this food chain again. Um, 
So yes, as, as well as understanding the sort of biodiversity impact, um, it's important to kind of see wood as solid CO2, which is something that we do as a business. So um, this is the workshop in South East London where we have a team of like fantastic, um, like wonderful, lovely people who, who make the furniture. Um, we work together and designing and making. We have a mill where we process the wood um, and, 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 a, and a workshop where we, where we um, turn it into beautiful objects. This is kind of our typical collections, um, largely sold in the UK um, through retailers, through architects, interior designers. Um, and this is the kind of principle that sort of underpins how I view wood as literally the best material in the world. Um, this is the chemical equation for photosynthesis. And the second part of the equation is biomass, which is wood. So if we view wood in this way, um, we can actually be locking carbon up, making pieces of furniture for people, storing that carbon in the built environment. Um, and then as we regrow the trees in the woodlands that we've harvested, uh, we're actually soaking more CO2 up. And as a business, uh, each year when we operate, we count the amount of carbon that we've, we've absorbed into, into wood or that we've kind of stored into people's homes that we've kind of siloed. Um, and as a business, with that factor, we are considerably carbon negative. So we have um, uh, a significant um, negative draw uh, on, on carbon, on the atmospheric carbon. And this is pretty typical of the kind of pieces that we make. Um, we also, uh, yeah, we kind of collaborate with brands like we've done work with Burberry and, and different kind of uh, British institutions. Um, we've exhibited our work in the V&A and other kind of amazing museums. Um, oh, yeah, we also um, kind of thinkers as well as designers. And I recently published a manifesto last year about land use, um, which kind of looks at how we can better use our woodlands to yield both uh, food and forestry and how we can basically create a more biodiverse and, uh, and, and resilient landscape. Um, and this final image shows a piece of tech that I've been working on as well, as well as kind of wooden products. This is a, um, a collaboration that I've been undertaking with another designer called Florian Dusport of a piece of tech which plugs into machinery and basically counts the carbon. So I'm always kind of tinkering as a designer with problem solving and um, kind of, uh, you know, as Holly has said, you know, I really do see all things as connected. So whether it's kind of managing a woodland or designing a kind of techie piece or writing a, a big wordy document, um, I feel very much at home tackling those issues. So that is me, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Sebastian. Was that seven minutes? Was that less than seven minutes? I'm, I'm really not timing it, but okay, good. Start, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it. Yeah, that's 14, we're, right. like, we're 614. Um, so actually, I was going to go back and forth, but actually, I think I'm going to ask Egg the next question and then, and then go back to you, Seb. So, um, Egg and Memnon, the, the combination of projects you've created, um, they support and feed into one another to create a resilient, regenerative, collaborative set of communities, which ripple, seem to ripple out to other communities. Can you share a little bit more, um, and given that we're a political party, maybe, um, tell us as well while you're sharing about your project, how we could reposition the political conversation to address some of the societal failures we're all experiencing. Now it's a big question, so. Well, let's, let's break it into to three parts. Um, the, I think the, the sort of issue that a lot of us are addressing through whether it's Extinction Rebellion, the Green Party, or our daily greening of our own rebellion against being extinguished. Um, the effect of uh, the current system is feels people I have consistently felt don't feel heard. Um, and um, one of the, so in in Brixton, I guess in 2010, 11, there was I was on the um, the left borough state and in between 40 and 60 people a year were dying of cold related issues. I mean, I, I don't know if people recognize the fact that in the UK, the numbers are, are somewhere around 39,000 people a year die of cold related issues, right? Whereas 29,000 people a year are dying of air quality related issues. Um, and, and so, you know, there's this idea that we have to go to the third world, you know, they don't even we use this, this grandiose term, we're gonna go over there to help with them but we can't even help ourselves here. And when we try to, the system itself doesn't work. Um, and when, when I was knocking on my neighbor's door to say, you know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna change this? How do we effectively do that? I asked the question to myself, 
you know, can I get out of bed in the morning without destroying the world that we live in, you know? When, and you, you turn on the light if you get up early, right? And all of a sudden, who is that? Is it EDF? Is it Eon? Is it good energy? Is it bad energy? Who is it? What is it? Is it strip mining in Algeria? Is it gas from you? You know, 70% of the egg, 77, 70% of the eggs that we boil in the morning, or you might be a vegan, so of the vegetables that you boil are down on Ukrainian gas. You're like, where is that coming from? Why is it happening from there? You know, there's geopolitical discussions that are happening in every movement you make. You go to brush your teeth, you turn on the water. Oh my God, Thames water or, you know, the water systems and there's all these things that come up and, and how they make a decision. And so the political system seems to have a separation between what we as individuals know is wrong, what we as individuals don't know that we know is wrong and what the political system does to us. So the unknown is that we feel that there's a disconnect about the things that we're not sure about. And then there's a clear narrative about the things that we're sure are wrong and they're not happening. Like we 70 something percent of the UK did not want to go to war and Tony Blair went anyway. You know, again, that happened again, it's like 70, 85% didn't want to go that we didn't want to do nuclear and we did it anyway. Um, and so there's, there's that real disconnect in political system. And I think the second part of the, the question, I mean, you can help me. The second part of the question was around not the political element, but what the work that we're doing now. Yeah, yeah. how it sort of, um, there's a word that we've been using and it's totally clearing my mind, but letting communities sort of make decisions for themselves and the positive effect that has rippling, almost rippling the other ways. So rather than democracy happening to us, having it be democracy something that we do. So almost the projects that you're doing becoming a political act because they're signaling in the opposite direction, I guess. Yeah, and so that's like bringing it back into the actual tangible knocking on doors in Brixton, in Loughborough State, and you're knocking on that door. And that's the thing that opened the door. When you open the door, it wasn't like, oh, you wanna put solar panels on our house and make a garden. It was like, are you the council? Are you a private company? What is this? And if you say, no, we're a part of a community organization made of members of the, and, and residents, and we're trying to educate the young people and um, give employment to people in, who need work, support elderly and those in need, in need um, by reducing your energy bills and providing advice. Okay, and, and, there's, and no one, and, and we will cooperatively succeed together or we will cooperatively fail together. And that was, that was the gist. And really what you did is you had two seconds. You knock on the door and people are so exhausted. They would be like, what? You'd be like, we're trying to set up a project. Are you interested in supporting it? It'll provide you training and reduce your energy bills. And that was, you know, you had that window sometimes to knock on the door. And if we got enough yeses, and it was even on average, because we've been doing this for about um, nine years, on average, you're looking at 90% um, of people said, yeah, uh, it'll happen. Um, but only about 2% would come down and come every Monday or Tuesday and say, yes, I want to do this. Here we are. And you make a nice little team and you work on a regular basis. But when you did that, those people all had 10 to 12 people who work with them and you'd have a hundred people at a little event. And then when you wanted to do something bigger, it'd be a thousand people because 10, 10. So there was this incredible movement towards um, making change a reality by using one of the fundamental pieces, which was energy. And through energy, we then began to work with um, uh, the solar panels and, and, and get in there. And it was sort of like a gateway drug. Think of solar as the gateway drug. And then you can get into biodiversity and like, saving water and saving um, by, you know, the uh, air quality by at acting that way. But it was almost by coming, being grounded and being clear with people that cooperatively, when we work together, we can make a difference that really shifted things. And, and one of the first community energy projects on social housing turned into 10, turned into 100. We ha I helped to found Community Energy England, uh, along with four uh, amazing people. And then, and, and you know, community energy has really grown now, but I really feel it's grown much bigger than just energy. And, you know, and it's really about resilience. And so co-ops is one of the main things I've set up um, about nine co-ops. And I've, I'm definitely a proponent of that. So the, the final piece I think is like the act of actual, actual activating of citizens 
um, is that when people feel that they're that they can consciously choose turning on that electricity in the morning and know that the energy in their house is that when they can consciously buy their food from either um, a local shop um, or or a farmer's market or pick something that they've grown it, and they consume it, it has a very different impact on their life. And, and I think that's what activates people to then realize that it's not that far to change the political system. That was the light, the sort of more complex part of the first part of the question. Very good answer, thank you. Um, and Sebastian, sort of similarly, um, there's been a movement sort of throughout the UK for farmers and rewilders and land managers to start looking at ways of um, reversing the, 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 the ripple as well, where taking sort of not control of land, but creating an environment where biodiversity can thrive. And through that thriving, as you sort of explained in your introduction, um, uh, be able to create, fill human needs as well. Um, and you wrote this manifesto, which I happen to have on my desk right mm. here. Um, and I was hoping that maybe you could, A, sort of share a little bit about how this, I, I believe it was sort of a collaborative approach, what you created um, with other land managers and, and people who are creating with, with gifts from the land. Um, but then also same question, given that we're a political party, what do you think we can do to help reposition the conversation around the not only the issue of land but also the issue of consumption and um and creation yeah <clears throat> um again you know big question I, I agree with a lot of the sort of final point of what agamemnon just said in terms of like you know that that spiraling effect of of, of ins inspiring people actually you know and, and giving them the opportunity to, to to you know buy into things have things around them so for me um as a designer um i'm kind of really interested in uh creating beautiful objects that tell a story and making that available for people to have i mean obviously the difference uh between the you know the two of us is that i'm running a private business um so you know i've i've got my staff to pay and all that kind of stuff um so uh i'm, I'm looking to sell a product but what i what i have done is shape a business which sells product which delivers a really good message which inspires people and we try to do things around the product and those sorts of things so i believe i mean consumers is a very uh, uh you know a word i'm, I'm not going to use here shoppers and citizens let's separate them out um the, the, you know the shoppers that we sell to uh we 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 think you know for every for everyone who buys something from us rather than one of the other furniture stores like you know um habitat or heels i mean actually i've worked with both of those retailers and i, I don't want to i don't want to slate them um too much but um there is a lot of crap that's uh, effectively a, you know a lot more money than it should be because you have many many middlemen in the process of actually getting that object from a factory in china to someone's uh, living room and um, people would be astonished at you know the actual original value of that so for me it's about telling stories about what those chains are about um how by shortening them um, we can deliver better value to people um, uh, that, that, that consume the things they have and they can better understand and scrutinize where the things come from, like your Ukrainian gas for boiling your eggs. Um, you know, it's, it's about um, making, it's, a, you know, transparency, making that information available. And um, I think as a business, I try to sort of lead by example in that sense. And then to, to sort of, you know, the question about the kind of manifesto and, the, and of, of land use and that kind of thing, um, really that the whole essence of that was a similar line of thought in terms of shortening supply chains basically and that's that's the sort of essence of solving the food system problem i think anyway is uh, i like to try and view things as simply as possible and actually just shortening the supply chain and ask questions is seems to me like a pretty sensible way to kind of tackle that one because if you see what a battery chicken farm you know you, you could have i say shorten the supply chain you also have to ask questions because you could live next door to a battery farm and you could very much shorten that supply by buying, down, buying direct from them. But I'm pretty sure if you set foot in there, you might be like, actually, this isn't really for me. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the guy around the corner who's you know, selling something else. Um, I do think that there's, and I, 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 um, I recognize this is a political party discussion. I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm normally you know, quite, quite steer away from policy, which seems weird when I was sort of writing a manifesto. A lot of people have said, is this a policy document? And I kind of actually tried to quite clearly state in there that actually it's kind of just a guide for shoppers, consumers, citizens. Um, but I do think that there is something in this idea of um, land ownership, you know, um, uh, 
the biggest ethical question I think we can ask ourselves is how we use our land, because with land, we can unlock any of the problems that we face, whether that's growing more food or growing energy or um, you know, harvesting any of the kind of resources that the natural world wants to give us, which ultimately is the answer to a lot of the problems that you know, we've presented with now is that we've turned to the kind of mineral world for too long. So land is really a way of unlocking sustainability. And that is the sort of big question is like, when you talk about these kind of rewilding projects and the enthusiasm that's going on there, I went to the brilliant uh, rewilding conference last year at Cambridge University. And there was this kind of like appetite in the air, which was like, wow, this is amazing. How do we get involved? Because we don't own three and a half thousand acres. Like, how do we, how, how, how do I do this? Um, and that's the kind of like big problem with rewilding, I think. Um, so there does need to be this sort of like there's kind of three pillars. I can't remember which professor um, said this, um, but there's kind of like three pillars to kind of land ownership. It's like obviously government owned land, privately owned land and then community owned land. And we just have way too much. It's like if you think of it like a three legged milking stool, we're currently like just balancing on one leg really precariously. And perhaps we need to get the other two feet on the ground a bit more stably. So, you know, community ownership of land uh, could be a really great way to unlock a lot of these problems. Um, Guy Shrubsoll's book, uh, Who Owns England, obviously um, addresses a lot, of, a lot of this stuff. So that would be I'd, I'd send you there. Um, but yeah, does that answer both part of the questions? I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that does, and um, and I think that kind of ties in to Agamemnon. I'm now not remembering, but when I spoke to Agamemnon, we were talking about about even just commute land within the city and how it's being used and access to that land and the opportunities that it holds when 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 it's given back to the communities to decide what they want to do um, with it. And Agamemnon, we have a question for you as well. Um, obviously, the projects you represent are wonderful examples of groups of people who are working together to essentially retrofit and regenerate their communities, both functionally, but also in doing so, finding ways to enhance overall well-being, which you touched on before, um, through, their connect through the connection of, of people and place. And I was noticing on your website, um, you have this uh, calculation for the social return on investment that that um, intersection creates. Um, can you share with folks what that means and a little bit about the regeneration that the, the programs you run have helped create? One of the key things when we talk about policy um, and where a direct activism meets um, change is in decoding, unpicking, or translating from to one community to the other. And I think when we look at politics, a lot of times what ends up happening is there's a disconnect in um, communication, just like sometimes the way we think about when you say, I feel sick, the doctor's diagnosis is using different words. And sometimes you say, I want you to do something. And, and, and they're saying, I'm doing everything I can. But actually, if we communicate in a different way, we can, um, we can come to a solution. Um, and... Uh, and that happened not only for me in my life with illness, because I've had cancer twice, um, and, and worked with doctors to come up with other solutions, but also with policy. I've worked on for with all with um, the Labour Party, the Conservative uh, Party, and the Cooperative Party to help work on manifestos very specifically to address um, this issue, which is the government, regardless of who is in power, whether it's the Green Party or the Tories, the, they will have a metric that they use. They'll say um, the NHS spends 110 billion pounds a year uh, uh, dealing with obesity or with a um, ment of 240 billion on mental health or um, cold related issues or whatever. And so they'll have a metric or an index that they use and they'll say um, this is worth X and if you can keep um, people out of fuel poverty or you can be people out of uh, who are suffering in mental health in this way then it it saves the NHS this much it saves the the um, the, the uh, incarceration system uh, this much and so the metrics that were there for um, well-being um, for sense of belonging sense of place there are specific metrics that the government uses um, uh, for, for savings. And so I extrapolated that data um, uh, working with um, different universities across Europe. And then now I've been working for the last two years with Imperial uh, College and the um, policy for the Center for um, Environmental Policy 
in, in Imperial. Um, and, and very specifically honing in on assessing how people feel in the projects we're working on using the government metrics. So when the government says, well, yeah, but it's a great project, which has happened before. This is a great project. We really believe in it. You know, everybody wants their Twitter shot shot on the rooftop with the solar panels and the young people or in the garden or with a beehive or something. But they want to see the metrics. And there he's like, oh, well, I've got it for you. The social return on the money invested in this project returns this much money to the NHS, this much money to the government. And that is how we did it. And, it, and we, we were conservatively showing that for every pound that is invested into Energy Garden, you are getting 11 pounds 37 back for the community. So, so we have, so it's all built on a cooperative, right? So for everybody who invests into the cooperative, there'll be a 4% return. But on top of that is a social return of 11 pounds 37. And so to come up with these metrics, you know, I can say kumbaya and give me a hug because there's young people going through paid accredited training and we have 100% BAME young people going 16 kids a year going through 40 weeks of learning about finance, IT, technical, legal, media and marketing and getting employment and stuff. But there's no theory of change on that, which dictates how much that's worth to the government. Unless I can say that we've stopped X amount of them from, you know, real, uh, young offenders from going into jail or X or Y. But if I can say these people feel this way and have done this over that amount of time, then the government can recognize that. And that's what the social return on investment is. And this directly relates to what um, uh, Sebastian was highlighting. And I want to just touch on this idea. Like when you first started, Sebastian, you said, I don't want to say consume. Um, uh, consumer, uh, you know, I want to say citizen, there's actually a moment where we're moving from being consumers to prosumers. We're proactively consuming. We're proactively choosing how we want to spend our money. And every decision we make is an opportunity for resilience and regenerative cultures, right? And so if we choose to um, invest our money into things like, you know, sustainable sourced wood materials that have been made in your workshop, that is a choice which actively encourages more resilience in and more sustainable development. And in so is the same with the community energy projects that we're working on with the transport network. It, every time you get on the tube and it starts to go and you hear that going, when you first start moving, that is 11 megawatts. 11 megawatts, so 300 homes is on a one megawatt, right? There's the usage, annual usage. 11 megawatts to get the brrrr going. So the, the huge consumption, we don't think about it because there's not like 10 to cloud tons of carbon that comes out in your face, but effectively that's what's happening to the environment. So if we're proactively choosing to invest into solar panels and greening spaces, in this project, then the social return will be this, the environmental return will be that, and the financial return will be four, four pounds. The financial return is 4%, the social return is 11.37%, and the environmental return is still being calculated because we, it's the theory of change on it. Can I make, we haven't planted enough gardens to actually reduce the amount of carbon, but we have created air shields where it reduces the carbon into the air. Amazing, yeah, and it and it and it really speaks to that intersect of um, of all the different aspects of our policy and your creations, and Sebastian's creations of trying to to link together the the different issues to create a different story, and and obviously our economy is is part of that. So so breaking that down in, in into measurables is is very clever. Um, so what do you both think that the formula for making change happen is? Um, actually, no, you know what? Sorry, Sebastian, I totally uh, skipped over your question. Um, you are a zero carbon business proving that we can boost biodiversity and draw down carbon and still do business. And you often collaborate with other businesses that are reaching towards or trying to achieve the same goal. So how has the process of regenerating and rewilding land changed the way that you create and the way that you see the potential of a zero carbon economy and even a zero carbon Britain? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think 
on, on a kind of personal level, I mean, I, I trained as a designer. Um, designers are trained to sort of look for problems, um, you know, and uh, and uh, I guess there was this sort of like um, enthusiasm that comes with being a student, which was like, well, I'll just go for the big one. I'll just go for I'll just go for sustainability and the environment. <laughs> well, like my my colleagues are kind of like trying to work out the ergonomics of a chair. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of been there since the very origins of my business I think I think um, kind of more uh, recent sort of movements or, or changes in thought like rewilding have kind of more, made a more recent change into shifting about you know thinking about how we more broadly impact things but it started off very small with me in terms of like I was literally driving to the wood yard and there's an amazing statistic which I learned on that trip which is that I was kind of going there and um, I studied in Lincoln, going through Lincolnshire, through Lincolnshire lime woods, all these lovely forests, get to the woodyard, it's all imported. And I was like, what? That's weird. And I kind of said to the guy that owns it, like, can I have some of the wood from down the road? What, where's that? Um, and the answer was no, but he couldn't tell me where, you know, where that was going. And so I got back to some researching and I found out that um, the only country in the world that imports more wood than the UK is China. Um, being second to China on any list is uh, really a great thing um and uh, yeah we import 87 percent of our timber here so i was kind of like why is that you know we, we, we have woodland we think of ourselves as a green and pleasant land of rolling countryside and it turns out we actually do have quite a low woodland cover but we have a very strong uh, heritage in the uk of of of, um, of of managing woodland on a small level, we have like one of the oldest examples of woodland management um, uh, in Europe. I think the, the Somerset levels, they've been coppicing there for thousands of years and kind of the evidence exists in the UK. So we've kind of been doing this for a long time and why have we forgotten? So that was the kind of essence of the start of the business. And I suppose it's not that um, I was a designer operating and then suddenly the environment dawned on me. It was like, I guess um, during my training, I became so aware I think also when you're a student, you're kind of like, you go away from home and suddenly you're, you're buying your own milk you're buying your own bread and suddenly you're like well what kind of bread do I buy you know and you ask those sort of basic questions of yourself and uh, at that same kind of time I was realizing that I was designing stuff I was training to like put more crap in landfill oh my god like what what heavy responsibility that is um so uh so yeah I kind of thought wow I've really got to take this seriously both in what I consume but also in what I produce um and uh, i kind of built the foundations of the business on that and the only way that i've been able to get this business going i think i would accredit it to um being a kind of like fairly good storyteller about like that niche issue of, of woodland and and how we use it but also a hell of a lot of luck i think there's been so such a sort of a groundswell of interest in um ecology the environment and, and that kind of issue thank god i mean we, we really need that and and actually probably you know many decades too late but um but yeah i feel like um i feel like it's been a kind of a number of factors which didn't necessarily kind of like land on me at once but i kind of built the whole thing and then and then kind of just responding to it as i go along as well so like thinking more broadly about well um how much woodland do we need to fulfill what you know my ambition of having a britain that's self-sufficient in, in forestry and then and then broadening that to like, well, what about food? Well, how much land do we need for that? And then, and then it kind of just grew and grew and then, and then out came a manifesto, um, you know, um, much to my wife's disdain, spent many evenings staying up late writing that. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I guess this, um, this final question that I have, and then we'll go over to the Q and A's, but what do you think, I mean, you've talked, you both talked a little bit about your formula for making change happen. What happened to you that, that incited change in your lives. But what do you think is the formula for making change happen in our communities and, um, and how do we engage communities in collaborating to solve the problems that we face? Either of you can go first. Well, I, I, if I could, yeah, I mean, I just a, a quick one. I think that something's really important and I don't have the answer for this actually, but I think it's something that we all need to think about really carefully is language. I mean, you know, we, we talk, we use a lot of words which can be potentially alienating because, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, you, you're very well versed in how to speak to policy and clearly also how to speak to communities directly. And that's a, a massive credit to you and your, and your skills. But I don't think everyone who I don't think everybody has that ability to bridge both how to speak to government about their metrics, but also then to knock on doors in Brixton. And I think that's maybe one of the things I'm not saying I have the answer here, but I think I think maybe you do. Um, 
because you know we we have to influence at both levels at the same time kind of pushing and pulling and i think that's absolutely um critical so i think we have to be really mindful of how we speak about these things and to not actually also to not kind of overwoke it as well i've got to be honest like i i um i don't know i kind of find myself sometimes wondering if we're all just going around in circles in in the circles in which we operate because we we kind of over worry about this kind of stuff maybe but yeah i don't know not a clear answer but a thought uh Go ahead, Agamemnon. I um, it's a it's a funny one because cooperatives um have traditionally, I mean, the Rochdale Cooperative was built on the coal miners, right, two hundred years ago, and um and they were trying to come together against the big landowners to um, uh, to be paid a decent wage and to open their own mines, right? So, but that was coal. Um, which we now is just full of disdain for coal, you know, but it didn't, it doesn't sort of um, sully or dirty the actual um, subject. And I think in that way, I, I, I do think that working as cooperators and we, um, we can collectively come together to deliver action. And I think this idea about being a, a proactively consuming is one of the key elements and um, always getting behind a, a community, every community has all the tools it needs. There is a someone who knows finance, there's someone who knows the community, there's someone who knows uh, energy, there's someone who knows uh, uh, wood, you know, um, there's the policy. It's about organizing that group and letting them know that they have the right to stand up for what they believe in because I have worked with many community groups and uh, we have 127 community groups across, uh, uh, um, across 34 sites in London right now um, where they are now autonomously knowing that there's a centralized system that has their full support. You know, when I looked in the, <clears throat> to my right here in the chat box, it was saying, you know, what's your next project? And I was thinking, don't ask me what my, next, what's your next project? You know, if I'm, if I'm close by, I'll help you out. Um, and I think that's the really the city. It's about for us as designers. Or you know, I'm I studied math, medicine, and architecture. I structure well-being, right? That's what I do. So I look at systems and try to figure out how I can create a a substrate where communities who are already infinitely more capable and intelligent and apt to solve their own problems need to be empowered. So I might be a purveyor of passion and purport to say, oh, I've done it before. You can do it. But the truth of the matter is, is all I'm doing is standing as a reflection for each of them to stand up. Every one of the project successes that I've had before have to are hung off of the, the amazing abilities of matriarchs from these social housing estates across London. They were amazing women who were, you know, 40 and above. And the only success that happened was because I was translating what they've been doing for 40 years into a business case and put it to the council and said, we've got people behind them. We've got 70 years of business from the financial and tech world, and we can help them facilitate this goal. You know, all of the answers are there. It's about looking at the business case and the business model. And I think that that is what's broken. We don't have capitalism. This is not the discussion. We have corporate socialism. We have governments who are out of control supporting large corporates to deliver uh, a, a fiduciary responsibility. You know, the, it's the highest return over the shortest amount of time. You know, no one's even doing five-year business plans anymore in the large banks because, it's a, because they want to make short-term gain. When we cooperatively come together and make reasonable returns over a reasonable amount of time and we proactively address the needs of our community, there is no problem. People say, oh, we need to put solar panels anywhere or wind turbines, when actually, if we change our behavior, that would be an immediately 40% reduction in energy consumption in the UK. If we just changed our behavior, the way we think about energy, right? Now, I'm sure that's the same with wood use. I'm sure that's the same with water use. And I'm sure it's the same with any other subject we can come up with. Good answer. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to move to the questions um, so that I um, live up to my promises for once. Um, 
So it looks like Joshua Scott's is the, the most upvoted question at the moment. Um, and the question is, what can we do to hold our politicians to account when they continue to build unaffordable housing that will benefit foreign investors over working citizens? Do either of you have an answer to that? I, I, I'm, that's beyond my pay grade, that question. I don't, I don't have an answer for that, I'm afraid. All right. Agamemnon, do you have any thoughts? You don't need to have an answer either. You can, you're muted. Can you read it again? Sorry, what can, can we do yeah. to hold our politicians to account when they continue to build unaffordable housing that will benefit foreign investors over working citizens? Yeah, I'm, uh, I would just say vote. Uh, we worked so hard to, to build the zero carbon um, uh, homes, so hard. And, and Boris just deconstructed it as the mayor of London and then he deconstructed it as the prime minister. We were going to have people having to create affordable housing, having to put energy efficiency in and be accountable and responsible. And the lobbying power of the building organizations that are out there, they put money in the right hands and it was stripped out. Um, it's about electing. It's about spending your money and choosing the right politicians and choosing, you know, not shopping with them, not backing them, not accepting what they're saying um and going with the people that's that's the only way i mean if you want to talk about i think the true political problem here is the fact that there is no international legislation on labor policy so when when these large companies can get their cheap wood or materials to build these properties it's because there's no one paying for the extraction cost the carbon emissions that are generated going across the world and there's no one, and, and the people that are being paid, those, are, they're not stealing from now, they're stealing from the past, cultural, socioeconomic delivery vehicles to put those people there, and from the future, because there's nothing there anymore. It's, a, it's been waste, it's now wasteland. So there are no social um, uh, responsible delivery agencies around policy in a global perspective. We need to have an international policy for um, accountability, and then these houses wouldn't even be able to be built because these building companies wouldn't be able to get cheap materials to build them. Yeah, and I think Seb, there was something in your uh, manifesto, I think about the true cost of food. And there's a fashion documentary out about the true cost of fashion, all those, all those um, impact, the, the impact on finance that we don't pay. Mm. I don't know if you know yeah. that off the top of your head. Yeah, there's a, there's a really good book called Green and Pleasant Land by, um, is it Dieter Helm? He was a policy advisor to former government. And he, he, he also wrote a book about natural capital as well. I think it was called Natural Capital. And he kind of quantifies, you know, by the time you've paid the farmers not to spray nitrogen upstream of the crops, and by the time you've um, accounted for the extra cost, cost of the NHS, again, this comes back to Agamemnon's um, uh, metrics, by the time you've put all of those in there, then cheap food on the supermarket shelf is, is, not, is not cheap. Um, and uh, yeah, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's the cost is just distributed to elsewhere. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions that was uploaded is from Linda Rogers and she, they have said, have councils outside London picked up on Energy Garden or is this up to the cooperative to be established to plant the Energy Garden? I live in rural Welsh community. I live in a rural, rural Welsh community, and I am fighting a nuclear new build on Enis Mode. Mon, sorry, Linda. Agamemnon, that one's for you. Okay. Um, but people have. I've had all sorts of politicians and, and parties come and, and ask, and I'm always happy to talk with you, everyone. Just send them over. And I think in in relation to the last question, along, along with. Um, what Sebastian was highlighting was Eleanor Ostrom governing the commons is really my playbook for how one thinks that, you know, <clears throat> so I noticed here someone said, oh, you know, we should be green candidates, you know, green party candidates. And, and I definitely um, believe that the best candidate for your area is you, whoever you are listening to this today, you're the best candidate for your area. And that's basically the proponent of that's Eleanor Ostrom's narrative, which is that the only people who should make policy about 
whether it's um, woodland management or um, uh, coral reefs or or whatever, or teachers should be people who are actually teaching in that thing, who are people who are actually managing that woodland, who are actually managing that that reserve. And and the moment that they step down, they don't become a consultant and 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 an expert because they did it for thirty years. They become retired, right? The person who is the expert is the person who's living in it. And I think that is, a, is absolutely fundamental, both to discussion around who should be party candidates. If you're in the, the thick of it in Anglesey and you want to fight this, you should become that. Because no matter how good I am at setting up community initiatives here in London, I might be able to give you a blueprint, but you are the one who has all the knowledge of that. And I think that's, that's really the key here. And that's what the key of 40 years research from a, globe, a Nobel laureate, Eleanor Ostrom's book, Governing the Commons, which I recommend everybody to read, um, is about how the most accurate policy and deliverance of resilience comes from people who are in it, doing it in the here and now. Good answer, thank you. Um, so another question is from Rachel Swaby. Um, Kate Raworth talks in Donut Economics about building economies that are regenerative by design as a worthy ambition. What does that phrase mean to you? And do you see it as achievable? And is it something you're trying to apply to your work? Thank you. Um, I'll, take, I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, so it's got the word design in it, so I'll have it. Um, yeah, so I mean, rege regenerative for me um, essentially means that um, we put back more than we take, um, you know, which, is, which I think is perfectly possible. I think, um, I'm, I'm an optimist, I'm a positive person, and I do believe that we can, you know, we can exist on this planet. The, the solution is not fewer people, it just has to be a smaller impact uh, from the people that we have. And um, so for me, it's about finding ways to do it. And I believe that um, whilst not perfect, the business, the products that I offer kind of begin to show an example of how if you think from that basis of like what, what, what's here, what does nature want to give us, what have we got, what can we take that will improve things um, and that doesn't take too much um, and how can we still make beauty with that, human beauty with that. Um, so that's kind of what it means to me and I think, I hope, my ambition is that my business becomes an example of that which may inspire other people to start other businesses that do the same or, um, or as Holly mentioned earlier, collaborate with other businesses who have that same ambition. Agamemnon, do you want to speak on that, that question as well? I'm trying to respond to the things in the chat box. Ask me the question again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was Kate Raworth talks about in Donut Economics about building economies that are regenerative by design as a worthy ambition. What does that phrase mean to you? And do you see it as achievable? And is it something you're trying to apply to your work? Yeah. Um, I like Kate. I've sat, I've sat on a many a, a panel with her. Um, and I, it basically form follows function. Um, and I feel a lot of times we've, we've been disassociated for a long time from, from that. Um, and uh, we can all come up with great ideas. Um, I might come up with great green ideas in my green tower, you know, like, oh, a glass tower, you, oh, you come up with your ideas. But it's only until you get down on the ground and working with the physical problems. You know, Sebastian was saying he's a problem solver. You know, he looks for the problems and they come up with solutions. Effectively, <clears throat> until we get into the weeds and start to work with it, that and, and someone else was, I think it was um, uh, Lowell Bishop was highlighting, you know, we need visionaries. Yeah, you, sometimes you need someone who can dream and who can get above the, the and look down and, and come up with some solutions. But it's not until we get into the nitty gritty of it and really struggle with the darkness, because a lot of times the light is in there. It's, you know, the, the crack where the light gets in is the, is the actual answer. And so... Um, I think what, for me, it, it means that everything is worthy and possible, but you need to open oneself up to listening to your community, uh, wh whoever that community is. For me, it literally means, you know, um, matriarchs on, in, in social housing estates and um, local people who live near train stations. But, you know, it, it might be designers or it might be um, teachers. 
Great answer. Actually, um, for folks who are watching as well, the first ever Zoom that we did, one of the guests we had, um, Ian Solomon Kowal from May Project Gardens, he said something similar to what Sebastian and Agamem Agamemnon have shared, saying that if you're looking for solutions to problems, look to the, the peoples that are most marginalized by that problem, and they'll usually have the answers. Um, if you want to go back and watch that, um, we'll, we'll add a link, as well as the book list, which folks have been asking about, um, to the follow-up email for, for this event. Um, I'm going to get Graham as well, who's, who's from the Green Party, to share our next event, where another boat dweller is also, just, who just happens to live in the same community as Agamemnon, is going to be one of the guests. Um, so you can sign up, and we'll answer maybe one more question. Um, let me see. Well, this is a really um, simple but important one from Ian Richardson. What should we be teaching 10 year olds today? The next generation. Um, get them on the land, get them on the land, get them in the woods, get them in the fields, start there. Um, I, I, I don't think you can make it too complicated. I think you keep it really simple. Um, get them into the natural world, get soil under their fingernails and um, I think that will that'll do the trick. <laughs> um, that they can make a difference. Um, that they that their choices will shape their world. We don't believe that. A lot of people don't believe that the choices they make every day shape their world around them. Um, and uh, that this is it. That the their their future has been stolen from them. And we, they literally have to make it back now, um, that they have been betrayed by their, um, maybe not by their direct parents, but their parents' generation um, and about three generations back. Uh, and they have to do what we weren't able to do. Um, they have to come up with a solution for uh, what will happen is that you, you'll see huge die-offs in the sea, the air quality is gonna change, the, the amount of, of weather systems and the climates that we know are going to totally change in the next few years. They need to know that we, that humans are capable of destroying, but they are, that they are, have the capability of also doing the right thing and changing things for the better for the environment and not, and the final thing is they need to know that people will die from their actions, but the earth will still live and that they can help to create a better future and one that we can all live in. Thank you. Well, folks, it's one minute to seven, so we'll end this here. Thank you, everyone, for, well, thank you, Agamemnon and Sebastian, for your wisdom and for sharing your projects. Thank you to everyone who came to this live and for all your amazing questions and comments. Um, it's been nice to see the lively chat going on while we've been talking as well. Um, this will be available for uh, rewatch or replay if you want to share it with your friends and family um, in the next couple of days. And we'll have another event next week, uh, same time, same place, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. with a group of um, folks who are working on the, the subject of health as a green issue. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful evening, and we will speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you.